Good morning, everyone, once again, and thank you for coming for symposium What Art Means Today and the launch of Malevich. And um, we are about uh, to discuss topics which I guess are of interest of uh, the whole world, really, not necessarily art society. The whole idea uh, of symposium and Malevich actually came to me quite a long time ago, like maybe a couple of years ago. And I was talking to museum directors who were complaining how hard it is to find drives for museum shows and this takes a lot of time instead of making something creative. And also my friends artists who would complain that um, it's very hard to make something forward looking and risky because uh, um, if we explore the new media and the new forms of the art and new ideas. And I thought also um, the art world lacks transparency in a way as it is today. So I thought how to facilitate all of this and came up with an idea to create an ecosystem which will be beneficial for every participant, as it should be. How to make artists happy and how to make museums happy, how to make collectors happy as well. So Malevich actually explores all of these three domains and um, Malevich studio is uh, this part of Malevich where we introduce forward-looking artworks and today we will see Ed Furnelli's Finilier, which was specially commissioned for the symposium. This is, uh, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. And um, Finilier is connected to data and actually is going happy and uh, fun and joy when the data goes up and he goes down and vomiting and having hangover if the data goes down. So you can connect it to Instagram, you can connect it to fluctuation of the pound, you can connect it to any Facebook or something. For now, it's connected to Facebook, so you can see he's quite happy. And um, Malevich collaboration is another part of Malevich where we help an, a gallerist and artists to create shows which will be exposed in museum. So today uh, we present Jeremy Shaw film. Where is Jeremy, by the way? Oh, he's here, okay. Yes, and then so he will tell a little bit about it. It's quite a secret. So this project is going to be shown only in 2020 in Centre Pompidou and then in Swiss Institute. But uh, we present it on the platform in advance. And we actually have already a collector who bought it. So Malevich platform started to work already <laughs> successfully this week. Um, so this is one of the projects. And in future, we already have a schedule to co collaborate with different museums like Hamburger Bahnhof and Lakma Museum and uh, Goldsmith uh, Gallery as well. And Sarah, director of Goldsmith, is here. And we discuss uh, Tony Koch's uh, commission, which we are going to do and sell over the platform to fundraise for her show. So uh, this is the idea of um, helping to realize a fantasy which has never been before and wouldn't be realized without Malevich. And the platform itself is uh, very beneficial for collectors as well because it's completely transparent. You can actually see uh, how it fluctuates, how you can actually buy things without being shady because um, I guess today we are shifting to 21st century and the century not necessarily starts with the uh, 2000s, but actually, like, if, if you think about 20th century, it started after the First World War, I guess. So today, I think uh, everything changes in a way that we become more communal and more collectively oriented. We can see it in different uh, activities of society, like ecology or gender politics. It's already being very successfully proceeded, uh, but in art world, not yet. And I guess... Um, I guess this is what we are helping to make now, to build this ecosystem where, which allow us to be generous and uh, in a collective effort to realize something exponentially which uh, would never happen if we would act individually. So this is my idea of like uh, the time of Picasso, big Hollywood stars or uh, big dictatorships is over. It's coming to an end. So today it's more about collective effort and ecosystem and something which we can actually enhance each other's activities by sharing these ideas and sharing also our deeds. So this symposium aim today is to raise these questions, to define the problems and to find solutions. So I want to present hans Ulrich Obres, the moderator and the speaker of the first part of symposium, who will explain us uh, about generosity and interdependency and uh, what, how, what art means today and what we can do for development of it.
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Svetlana, for bringing us all here together. And uh, I'll just give a short introduction, and then we'll uh, hopefully open it up to our wonderful speakers uh, here on the panel, and of course also to all of you, and make this a true uh, polyphony this morning, uh, a polyphonic discussion. Um, I uh, was excited when Svetlana suggested you know, the theme of uh, generosity. I think it's a key theme for the 21st century. I'm working on a book right now with the Norwegian explorer and writer and author Erling Kage. He and I are basically writing a book on this on the theme. I, I believe it's one of the urgent themes of, um, of our time. And of course, the question uh, here today will also be how we can actually, in a way, connect technology and the way technology transforms and changes the art world to that theme of, um, uh, of generosity. Marshall McLuhan has noted the ability of art to anticipate the future in the forward to his book, Understanding Media. It's kind of interesting to reread actually this forward again in 2019. He calls art an early alarm system, which is pointing us to new developments in times ahead and allowing us to prepare to cope with them. He says also that art as a radar environment takes on the function of indispensable perceptual training. In 1964, when actually the book was first published, the artist Namjoon Pike was just building his robot K456. And when I interviewed Namjoon Pike around 2000 about this, he was saying that it's actually not about using technology uh, as an entertainment, but to somehow use the poetic and intercultural capacities and forces which maybe technology can give us. And I think that's somehow relevant today. You know, how can we actually liberate intercultural and poetic you know, capacities of technologies? And that, of course, brings us to what many artists do today with AI, what many artists do today with blockchain. We are actually going to hear about that from you know, some panels later. And of course, what many artists also do in relation to ecology and the looming forces of extinction which needs to, need to be, need to be uh, resisted. Now, one of the things which I think is very relevant in relation to that is what Tim Berners-Lee told us at the Serpentine recently when we invited him to speak at the Serpentine, the uh, eminent uh, inventor of the World Wide Web. And it's kind of interesting, I think, to talk about him today here in the context of this, uh, of this panel because, of course, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web exactly 30 years ago. It was in March 1989 that he invented it, and he more recently talked a lot about this looming danger of actually uh, losing net neutrality. And that's, of course, I think one of the things we need to ask ourselves every day, you know, is not only what we gain from new technology, but what we... Is it okay acoustically, or do I have to speak louder? But can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So otherwise I'm going to speak louder. Yeah, but maybe... Yeah, it's probably the building works. We would have to ask them to stop for an hour and go on a coffee break. <laughs> maybe. Anyway, and anyway, we should not underestimate the importance of coffee breaks. I just wanted to say that on the, you know, from the get-go here, at the beginning of this... Uh, Malevich uh, Symposium Svetlana has uh, introduced and brought us together here. My experience has been that very often the most important things happen in the coffee breaks. When we all I actually once organized the conference where I brought together everyone and then I canceled the conference just 10 minutes before the conference and we only did it as a coffee break. And quite a lot of things, you know, started to, to happen. Anyway, to come back, uh, as in French, we would say revenons à nos moutons, to come back to our topics here. Um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, right? I kind of lost the track. Uh, but anyway, it's all about non-linearity. Um, I lost the track, but I'm going to come back to the track. Tim Berners-Lee, 1989, the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Um, the, the danger of us losing net neutrality, because Tim Berners-Lee says, you know, famously, that the uh, World Wide Web should be for everyone. And he's, of course, very concerned that uh, the World Wide Web now is going to be split in a World Wide Web for people who pay for it, which is going to be fast, and a World Wide Web which is slower for people who can't or don't pay for it. He says, you know, this has to be for everyone. And we believe very much at the Serpentine that that should also be true for art. These new experiments, you know, with science, with technology, with art, with ecology, 
Um, they should be for everyone, which is why we have free admission for 1.2 million people every year, and why we also increasingly, not only with the pavilion, but now also with our first augmented architecture commission, uh, Ben is going to talk about that later, uh, we're going into the, into the park, Jakob Kurt Stinson, and of course, Lucia Pietro Justi is here, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, the projects with ecology, which are also, you know, for example, with our uh, events in the pavilion, you know, going outside the gallery. So this idea that this is for everyone, and the, in a way, who brought this together in a very brilliant way, you know, how we should actually address technology for everyone, is of course the amazing Sandra Perry. I wanted to just pick out this one case study here, the Sandra Perry exhibition at the Serpentine Typhoon, uh, an exhibition of Sandra Perry which explored the intersection of black identity of digital culture and power structures through video media installation and performance. So Perry makes work about black femininity, about African American heritage, and takes very often her personal history as a point of departure. So, using digital tools and materials, you know, ranging from blue screen technologies to 3D avatars and making them accessible for everyone. So all her work can actually be downloaded. It's all, in that sense, you know, open source. And she says also when we think about technology, we need to think about the fact that when making a piece, we have to make people feel that they have space and agency, you know? And I think that's a kind of a key thing in relation, I think, to the panel also I wanted to explore this morning, how can we actually make projects which give people, you know, that space and agency which is so needed for the 21st century. And of course, always thinking about the fact also what we can gain, but we can also lose through the new technology. We should be, I think, always aware that not only a million species are threatened from, you know, extinction, but that many cultural phenomena are about uh, to disappear, that languages disappear, you know, Tim Berners-Lee tells us net neutrality is about to disappear. So we're always in a sort of dynamic way, I think, need to think about what we can make, you know, or contribute to kind of resist these forms of extinction. And that leads us really, because I promised that this introduction would be sharp, because it's all about listening. And, uh, you know, the 20th century was all about manifestos. I believe that Etel Adnan is right. The 21st century should be about listening, listening to each other, listening to other species, listening to the planet. Um, as Etel said, we have to listen every day to the trees. So no manifesto here this morning, but listening. So I wanted to you know, immediately open it up and uh, introduce you know, our panelists. Um, we basically have an amazing group of people. And I think the amazing thing is that this amazing group of people is gathered again and again. So it's a new format, because we're basically going to have different themes in different constellations. <coughs> Deleuze Guattari talked about repetition and difference. We have Ben Vickers here, the CTO of the Serpentine Galleries. You already heard, of course, Svetlana, who is the founder and convener of uh, today's panel, Svetlana Marich. We have Lucia Pietro Justi here, who is the curator of ecology at the Serpentine Galleries. We have Daniel Birnbaum here. He's the director of acute arts. Svetlana already introduced Jeremy Shaw, the artist and film director, who will talk about this new project, Svetlana. Uh, introduced, and then of course we have also with us here Konrad Rotich, who is a finance lawyer, and is going to talk about, uh, you know, very uh, new aspects also of the the themes we're going to discuss. We have with us also Ed von Jelles, artist, uh, and we have with us also Johann Koenig. So a very warm welcome to all our speakers, please. <laughs> now, I was thinking that we could maybe begin with the main theme of this morning and, you know, this idea of uh, generosity, uh, how we can actually, uh, in this context, you know, of new experiments in science and technology, bring in new forms of generosity. And maybe we can just have a comment, a statement, uh, a short statement from each of the speakers, and I suggest that we start with Ben. Welcome. Thank you, hans -Eric. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, in terms of kind of throwing in a comment or a, a, I guess like a position. I, I think that one of the things that's interesting in this moment, particularly the kind of underlying technologies that inform Malevich, um, I think if we're thinking about new technologies and emergent ecosystems that we are witnessing obviously quite a significant shift in this moment where a series of quite radical uh, ideas that underpin cybernetics 
um, and therefore led to the creation of blockchain as a radical technology that was intended to undermine the existing financial systems. In the last month, we've seen it shift to uh, become things like a, um, in reference to something like Facebook's Libra, that we now have this kind of consolidation of a radical technology into the kind of mainstream. And I, I think that raises a lot of kind of interesting questions about uh, how that will change the systems that underpin society and how that will begin to uh, shift who has power and how power functions within those networks. And that we're coming to a moment in which uh, the assumptions that we made about the way in which uh, technologies would disrupt the society um, are not playing out as expected. And I think that we're seeing like a, a kind of radical shift away from the narratives that we thought would shape the 21st century. Um, and I think that that'd be an interesting thing to kind of explore in the conversation more broadly today. And particularly like the reference to say somebody like Sandra Perry, who was beginning to use open source software in her work. Um, the way that those kind of technological uh, approaches or ways of thinking and, and ways of building infrastructure are, have not really taken hold in the art world. And that maybe Malevich and these kind of ecosystems begin to represent that kind of shift. And I think it's a big question mark. I think, you know, as we approach the, the 20s, um, the world is gonna shift kind of on its axis. And it, it's, it's, in many ways, it's difficult to know what will, what will come next. We know that Lucia will now From one next. ecosystem <laughs> to another. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. And I think that uh, idea, uh, what will come next, will definitely be uh, the, you know, one of the main topics of today. So Lucia, I wanted to ask you if you can tell us a little bit about your view of how the art world can implement more ideas of generosity. I just wrote here a tale of two Merlins. And I'm going to try and figure out what that means. Uh, so. Uh, in terms of work, I work both as uh, the curator of general ecology at the Serpentine, and to me there's something generous about the notion of generalizing ecology. So how can one take principles from ecology and apply them, not only uh, you know, through the sort of themes and topics that are addressed throughout each form of expression of an art institution, and then how can those root themselves down into the kind of infrastructure with which we work. So that's the kind of generalizing of, of ecology in one sense. The generalizing of ecology in the sense that you don't have to be an expert in order to be able to or want to connect with other forms of knowledge. And in fact, it is much more productive not to be within a tiny niche facing something incredibly complex and massive that involves everything and everybody. And so to a certain extent, those forms of generalizing. Uh, I was then thinking about Merlin Sheldrake and the notion of from World Wide Web to Wood Wide Web and the generosity of trees, of course, which distribute through the mycelium network under forests. Uh, things like nutrients between the oldest trees, the so-called mother trees, and the, um, and the youngest saplings, and do so when they die as well. And so forms of non-human generosity and ways in which we can come to uh, recognize and valorize and, and even just model our own methodologies on those. And then I was thinking about Merlin in The Sword and the Stone, of course, the magician, who uh, asks for some sugar out of the uh, sugar animated sugar bowl, so another sort of non-human entity there kind of more technological, maybe robotic, like entity. I, I sort of hesitate to say that next to that. But uh, there's a, this kind of uh, human animation of an object. And then, I don't know if you've seen the sword in the stone. And then the sugar bowl just starts to pour sugar. And Merlin forgets to tell it to stop. And it just creates this kind of pile of sugar uh, in, the, in the cup of the magician. And then eventually, he freaks out. And then ev everything stops. And then and. I think that we need to also, in the kind of ecological sense, reflect on that kind of over-generosity, over-production, over-material that uh, we are sort of constantly in relation with. So when we think about making, how can we think about unmaking at the same time? How can we think about, I mean, it's, it's a question around compost, I suppose, as well. So can so I add one thing? I think generosity in a contemporary world is not excessive generosity. I think we should redefine the meanings of words. So generosity, I guess, is a, a balanced thing which doesn't harm anything else. Th I guess this is a new Indeed. idea of generosity. That yeah. would be an ecological kind of generosity. Yeah. And in a sense, then, uh, the uh, sort of last generosity, I was thinking this morning, and I realized sort of being a curator of performance, and this is the last tiny bit, because it has to do with curating the Lithuanian Pavilion in Venice, which is this kind of performance that involves children, dogs, singers, extras, p people of the audience, ne neighbors, you know, an enormous amount of mess. Um, 
the form of curating that is asked of a piece like that and the form of patronage that can come to support it are quite different from forms of collecting. So it's different kinds of generosity and modes of expressing also in that kind of ecosystem. For those who don't know, Lucia curated the Pavilion of Lithuania in Venice Biennale in Venice this year, and she got a golden lion. Big round she of won. applause. And the pavilion looks like a beach where everybody's having a good time. Yeah. At the end of the world. At the end of the world. <laughs> now, it's interesting, uh, you know, thinking about uh, generosity, of course, uh, I was also thinking, you know, in terms of the idea of uh, Tim Berners-Lee, this is for everyone, you know, it is something which happens, of course, very much with our pavilions where uh, hundreds of thousands of people can experience in the park you know, a structure, and for the first time this year, it's going to happen digitally with an augmented reality pavilion with Jakob kurz -Dinsen. And I just thought it would be great, Ben, if you can tell us a little bit more, because it's imminent. It's going to open on the 11th of July about, about this experience, which will be an AR experience in the park. And that will then lead directly to Daniel's experience. Yeah, maybe that's a sensible AR. connection, because you've worked with, Acute has worked with Jakob previously. Um, so just to kind of give a summary of the project, obviously, as Hans Eric um, cited, uh, the Serpentine is well known for its pavilion, and over the course of the last couple of years, we've been gradually introducing new technologies into various strands of the programming uh, to think about the way that they uh, might shift the program and create new opportunities for, for artists. And what we undertook in the last 12 to 18 months was a project called Augmented Architecture. So it emerges from the observation that augmented reality will serve as a kind of digital layer on top of this reality. Um, for people that are maybe not familiar with it, the, the easiest reference point is Pokemon Go. Um, and Pokemon Go is a kind of strange uh, manifestation of this technology because I don't think anybody anticipated that it would um, arrive so quickly um, that we would have this kind of other layer of reality. And so the observation is that uh, architects and people who think about kind of spatial environments have a critical role to play in shaping what this technology can be and what it can do. And so we created a open call uh, inviting with, da with David Ajay, um, who actually guided us and suggested that we shouldn't just ask for architects to apply, but actually we should open it out to many more people because it's quite likely, he thinks, that the next kind of architects um, to come in this moment won't necessarily come from the architecture discipline, but rather they will, you know, it could be kids in their bedroom using SketchUp, uh, it could be people designing, you know, castles in, in video games, because the technology used to produce buildings and, and to think through spatial environments is, is very quickly converging. And so we put out an open call and received about 350 applications uh, globally from a mix of artists, design studios, architects. Um, and the artist that we selected to work on the project is uh, Jakob kutz And the project that we'll launch in uh, Hyde Park next week um, is a manifestation of that. And what Jakob has done and, and where this kind of connects to Lucia's program as well is um, he's drawn out different species that are present in the park and created kind of strange manifestations of those. And you're encouraged to kind of enter those ecosystems and, and use your phone to have a kind of closer relationship with these kind of strange forms and to listen to them. Um, and so this is a project that I think we'll be taking into the future, um, but we're very keen to kind of open out the possibility for artists and, and creative practitioners to work with emerging technologies, because we believe that it's of critical importance to produce a kind of plurality around what technology is and, and the narratives that surround them and how they're received into society. And so I think we have a kind of shared mission in that sense with everything that you're doing at the moment, Daniel. So it leads it, right a away. logical bridge. Yeah. Yeah, it leads right away really to, to acute because also when we said, you know, Tim Berners-Lee idea, this is for, for everyone. Because of course, Daniel, you um, uh, basically uh, until very recently run a very big analog museum and uh, made this decision to actually shift uh, your vision of a museum director into, into a digital museum by becoming the artistic director of, uh, of Acute. And that involves projects with VR, it involves projects with AR, uh, all of them freely accessible. 
and more and more also going outside the museum space, as most recently in, in Basel and uh, Venice. Yes, true. So um, since a few months I work with this um, studio, or I'm the uh, artistic director of a studio, which is just around the corner here in the Somerset House, which is um, you know, a production site, but with some curatorial ambitions, um, producing works um, with very well-known artists, but also uh, younger artists uh, that use these new technologies. And, and um, because of the constellation of people here, I feel suddenly that I, uh, you know, what I was maybe planning to say is a little bit, I will start with something just because I see Norman Rosenthal here at the very uh, first row. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So I will carry this bit for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. The National Gallery, the analog museum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you did a show, and uh, the reason why I, I, I involved you immediately is because I, uh, you did this big show with zero artists in Istanbul, and I was involved with the, the same group of people. German artists who are now, um, you know, some of them are no longer with us, but the, um, uh, Heinz Mack, for instance, is. And, and I was just thinking a little bit more generally about this art and technology dialogue that uh, um, I have a background in, in, in more traditional academia and philosophy and, and the classical approach to technology if you study 20th century uh, critical theories uh, is one of, of critique and skepticism and uh, uh, you know the Heideggerian trope of, of uh, technology being the, the danger per se so to say. And, um, and I, I lived in and worked in, in Frankfurt, a small city, but with a very important history when it comes to you know, some sort of coordinates of philosophy with the Frankfurt School. Uh, and, and technological reason is somehow you know, the devil itself. It's the most dangerous. And, and, and uh, um, ecology represents something else, and there are versions of this, and there's the you know, Arne Ness and ecosophy and ecology, and there are other uh, approaches. And I was just thinking that in the, in the history of 20th century art, there are also very few places where one can see a pure um, optimism or, or affirmation of technology. I would think that Zero is, represents something like that. That's why I <laughs> mentioned you, Norman, because you did that beautiful show. Um, and uh, there are other examples. I mean, there's the futurism, of course, but that is an, um, a problematic place because it's a proto-fascist or maybe fascist kind of uh, movement. And then, then th what, what are the places where we see this kind of optimistic uh, approach of uh, where it's, you know, affirming technological possibilities. I would say experiments in art and technology, something that Ben often talks about and Hans Ulrich, this movement in the 1960s with, the, with Billy Cleaver and Robert Rauschenberg and all of those people. That was a playful, uh, 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 playful, and I would say not an affirmation, it was both, I guess, but, you know, using these possibilities that technology offers. There are, there's an exhibition that Hans and I will uh, you know, do something with called the uh, Les Imatriaux. That was Jean-François Lyotard, the philosopher, who at the very peak of his fame, he was maybe the best known public uh, thinker in Europe at that moment. He had coined the concept of uh, post-modernity or post-modernism, and, uh, uh, and, and, and then he did an exhibition for the Pompidou, I think the best funded exhibition in the history of that institution, uh, uh, you know, with the, that was about new possibilities, not only an affirmation, but it was clearly a techno-optimistic uh, uh, thread running through that show. And there are other examples, I'm sure, and, and, and here we are today talking about these possibilities, and I think it's more important now than ever to understand that that Heideggerian idea of its you know, only an apocalyptic idea of technology being the end of philosophy, the end of metaphysics, and after that we can only have a mythological kind of unclear approach. I mean, it has to be a, a little bit more hands-on and more, uh, you know, we have to use technology to go past beyond. Uh, Norman. I mean, I just have to say that one of the most thrilling, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Let's thro not throw out the analog, you know, you know to, and I, what is so thrilling in the last 24 hours, big headline in The Guardian and in a lot of newspapers is, as it were, the 11, the, uh, the, the, the 7 billion trees, as it were, that will save the planet. That's the best way to save the planet. It's not to plant 7,000 trees, which Boyce did. And I think to think of artists as well as being analog, analog artists as well as digital artists. You know what I mean? Boyce was very analog. But at the same time, he planted, wanted to plant 7,000 trees. Now we're told that the best way to save the ozone, you know, disaster that is impending is to plant, let, let's call it, 
7 billion trees. Let's start a movement to start 7 billion trees, the planting of 7 billion trees, which will save the planet, we're told. Isn't that thrilling? It's a very exciting idea, and I'm really so, so touched also that Norman is here, yeah. because, of course, uh, talk I'm about... No, but also we need to talk about, about Gustav Metzger. So when I, as a student, came for the first time um, to London, uh, Suzanne Paget gave me the telephone number of Norman Rosenthal. And I visited Norman at the Royal Academy, and we had, you know, a conversation. And Norman gave me a book of an exhibition you had curated at the ICA, which involved, in 74, which involved boys, but also Gustav Metzger. And it's the first time ever that I actually uh, heard the name of Gustav Metzger. It led to then me meeting Gustav Metzger. And of course, Gustav is at the origin of all the things we do at the Serpentine with ecology, because we did the Extinction Marathon with him. And once we did the Extinction Marathon with him, and he said, you know, we can't talk about climate change because no one is ever going to wake up. We need to talk about extinction. The day after we had finished the Extinction Marathon, he stood in our office and he said, we need to continue. It's not done. The job isn't done. You need from now on to work on it every day. And that led, of course, to us doing it now every day. And of course, Gustav did in Manchester the flailing tree, which is another interesting relation. So we're very, very grateful for this command for Norman to introduce us also to, to Gustav. And uh, back to Daniel. Yes, I mean. Um, Can I say something? Oh. <laughs> yes, I think actually technology will give us back to uh, vertical knowledge. Because at the end of 20th century, the knowledge became so horizontal, our communication system became so horizontal, and uh, even if you had a profession, which most oft often would be like your social destiny, what your parents advised you and so on, it would be very hard to switch from one social strata to another. And what Ben was telling about these projects, what I thought just now, this is amazing because it welcomes non-experts who are not destined to be experts in this area, but uh, actually they can uh, do it so much better because they have a different reason, they have a passion and uh, their anxiety to learn more and to create more because they did not inherit this profession and they didn't choose it when they were very young, for example, but now this technology is helping actually makes everybody equal. So it doesn't matter what background you have, using contemporary technologies, you can actually create your own self and uh, to do new things which you couldn't think about before. It's a very important comment because I think also uh, it uh, leads us actually to the next uh, uh, presentation, to the next uh, uh, speaker. And I thought it would be great to hear from Jeremy. Uh, and maybe Svetlana, you can also talk about that because you're both working on a project together. And we have a couple of case studies here. Uh, we have already heard about Sandra Perry because we both spoke about it. We heard also from Ben about Jakob Tulstins and we have the acute case study uh, the ecology, uh, general ecology uh, case study Lucia was mentioning, actually in relation to what you said, Svetlana, it's interesting also that ties in fully with uh, the quote Lucia mentioned of Rupert Sheldrake. Because more or less at the same time when I came to London and met Gustav Metzger in the 90s, I also met Rupert Sheldrake. And Rupert Sheldrake is, of course, working with this amazing network of non-scientists, you know, of amateur scientists, and says that in a sort of a way that's what Darwin did. He communicated with so many people who were not scientists and learned from them and listened to them and that we need to do that again. Now, anyway, we now have to do it on a professional level. That's the difference. So amateurs become professionals exactly. through technology. And that's why we're all equal. doesn't matter what's your background. You can really perform the same, like as much as your talent allows you. Thank and now we're going from technologies to cathartic technologies. <laughs> And I thought it would What's be great that? to hear <laughs> yes. from Jeremy and from Svetlana about your case study, which is the Cathartic Technologies Project. So cathartic. Jeremy is futurist, so, so it's not I, sounding very promising. I, have, I am not a Let's futurist. I, don't, I actually don't even know what that means anymore. Um, is this working? <laughs> um, so no more about generosity? We're moving into... We want to hear about <laughs> cathartic technologies okay. in relation well, to generosity, about generosity and how cathartic technologies connect to well, generosity. I, think, I mean, I was just thinking, I didn't have a lot to add to that because I was thinking as an artist, I think the act of making and exhibiting art to be a very generous thing in general um, and really don't privilege working with, you know, without, with open source media over someone painting in their studio. I think it's more about the the ability to disseminate this now is what, what's shifted so much. But 
So whether it's you having the Serpentine open for free or having, uh, you know, AR in the space, I think it's all, it's all equal to me, really. Um, but as far as this work, Cathartic Technologies is actually just a working title, so that's probably not a good thing to, to reference right now because it's a seven-channel film project I'm working on that uh, is really about... Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not totally related to this. It's about altered states and sort of the universality of, of cathartic behaviors uh, and belief and faith, et cetera. And it's sort of uh, a lot of my work deals with the, the loss of faith in, in culture and seeing if that's having an effect on how, uh, how we're evolving, really. So that's this piece is seven channels uh, that take place in various times in history that uh, essentially or eventually unfold into a, a sort of unified work. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to relate it to the, to the topics at hand here. Yeah, this is great. Be... Yeah, because <laughs> this project is just in progress, and this is what's amazing, so that Malevich can introduce projects which are discussed now, created now, they can change, they're very fluid in this essence. And so we, I guess, um, what I wanted to add to Jeremy's story, he's exploring uh, video, which is very democratic uh, media itself, and it's also his seven channel film is talking about subjects which are deeply uh, important in society and it's not really focusing on art at all but art i guess today is focusing on society a lot and art is as hans wurik mentioned earlier is uh, this um, big alarm for problems which we have in the society. And Jeremy's film exactly talks about it and explores topics which are important for our society and um, I guess maybe given some sort of answers or solutions on that. Or at least gives us borderline transcendental experience. Yeah. I guess this is what you, you want to shake people in a way like... Yeah, generally, I mean, they, yeah. they pay off. There's a phenomenological element to the works that... Yeah. that uh, attempts to elicit a similar response that what is happening on the screen themselves. And maybe one more question, you know, because of course, Norman is perfectly right, it's not about an either raw thing, either the digital museum or the analog museum, it's both and, instead of either raw, instead of... Isn't it? How yes. do we fuse the, dark, the, 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 Free admission. the digital mm. with the analog? Exactly, and that's... That is the, the key question. I would that say question, that... That that's question the urgent, is, is that's connects what you would to, call the urgent question. ...connects to both of your practices. And before handing over to Ed, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that, because, of course, you connect a lot to, you know, an age-old phenomenon of dance, and, um, and that has to do with an embodied practice. How do you connect that to then the digital? <clears throat> I'm not sure. I mean... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, in that piece, also. In this work. Well, the work, you know, I work, I work without modded mediums a lot of the time. So, you know, I'm working back into analog technologies, working with 16 millimeter and stuff, eventually to rupture them into a digital realm. But, um, you know, I often use these old technologies to sort of lure people into to being uh, sort of um, comfortable in watching the work and then, and then rupturing that with a digital sort of um, <clears throat> implementation. But to... to <clears throat> connect dance to the digital? I guess there's many ways. Uh, I don't know if I've figured it out, or if that's my ambition at the moment either. Well, we call that exhibition in 1974, which is 50, practically 50 years ago, we called it Art into Society, Society back into Art. That was, you know, it was, then we had seven German artists, you know, people like Hans Harker, Boris Metzger, and others, and that was, if you like, at that time, that was sort of in the wake of the, that exhibition took place in the wake of 1968 and all of the, that meant for large parts of the Western world. Now, I think possibly with the kind of children's revolution that is taking place in the, in the world of ecology, maybe, maybe, maybe the school kids of the world, some school kids in the world, are beginning to think in a similar way people were thinking in 1968. And I think it's quite an interesting question for you guys to perhaps answer, someone like Johan, for example, who grows up in Germany, why there is, why there's not been a student revolution again in the way, given, you know, given what happened in, 1960, in 1968 in Germany. Oh, but I think that this is, <clears throat> with this Fridays for Future movement, uh, pretty much happening, and uh, I have, like, 
a teenage son and uh, had like hard discussions to convince him to take an airplane uh, to fly into summer holiday in Mallorca. So, uh, and there was like uh, uh, almost like a, um, we had to kind of buy a carbon <laughs> certificate to balance that out. But I think an interesting question, I mean, somehow also related to this, um, like if we think of all these like art fairs happening all over the globe uh, with, with um, um, galleries coming from uh, everywhere and uh, flying artworks there and then the whole world flies to this one location in Hong Kong, Basel, Miami or, or wherever. Uh, so from an ecological point of view, that's a disaster. And uh, I think that art is only uh, they, um, I'm, I'm, in my work, I'm mainly focusing on experience of art and how to live through art and get to know art. And uh, that is probably informed by an accident I had as a child. Uh, and then for me, the, uh, Duchamp, of course, is a, one of the main figures in all of our today practice, I guess, even in, if you work with VR or so. So is Picasso. So it's Picasso, but Duchamp on another level. And then I had this very interesting experience when I first time saw uh, a bottle dryer. The idea was so much bigger than the actual experience of meeting this piece of art. And I think um, new technology gives us a chance, for example. I mean, there are some, things, some works you never can replace, but imagine we don't need to go to all these art fairs anymore. We don't need to, we don't need to ship... Uh, uh, so, like, from the, from the point of ecological efficiency, um, but still offering uh, a comparable um, experience, all these platforms like Malevich or Acute Art um, might offer us uh, a chance to democratize uh, work and uh, at least not make the planet worse. Can you maybe talk a little bit uh, about how you as a gallerist uh, address that? Because, of course, you've created a space in Berlin which involves you know, many different disciplines. There's the connection with O32C. There are lots of other channels of distributions you, you use. It would be interesting to hear a little bit more about that. So I came, I came to a point in my work where I thought either I close the gallery now and become my pure uh, agent, or I find some... Uh, some venue or, or uh, possibility of an involvement with art which is unreplaceable. So uh, I was lucky to find a brutalist uh, church, um, uh, uh, like a modernist brutalist church, uh, pretty much informed by British architecture, and uh, uh, redesigned it with Arno Brandlhuber, and it's like the opposite of the white cube. It's like, it has no white walls, it's, it's uh, sprayed concrete, but the interesting thing is because it's a sacred space, you have a sac it's like, I mean, I'm not a pathetic guy, but it's like almost like an awakening uh, experience. So it's, a, it's like an, you, you walk in there and you, you feel the energy and it's surprisingly enough at the center point of the city. So like the middle of Berlin is, is where the building is geographically. And, um, and you walk in there and it's an experience you can't, uh, you only can experience. So it's like a unique, and I, before I had a gallery in a, uh, also pretty nice, but like in a plywood, on uh, no, 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 a drywall, you know, all these galleries, they look, uh, in Sao Paulo, they look like in Munich, like in Bangladesh, uh, uh, or wherever you have, uh, or Hong Kong, it's always the same uh, replicated uh, art space. And I thought, why, why would you go cross town to see something on a drywall? You know, and um, and so um, so what we are trying to do is to create experiences. Can I add something? Yeah. So uh, it was amazing when I went to see Johan in April, and I come, Johan. I have an idea. We sell artworks from your gallery, but we don't move them from the gallery. We keep them in the gallery so everybody can come and see it, so people can buy it. Uh, as an investment, but instead of shipping it to a warehouse somewhere and paying money for co and for shipping and you know different uh, warehouse costs and so and on, why the would, was that? 
And, 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 and continuing on like yes. shipping stuff around carbon. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. So why wouldn't we keep it at the place where it was produced and make it accessible for everyone? Uh, that's a real democracy. So these are private collections in collective effort on view for everyone. So Malevich, it is technological platform, but actually it's standing for the life, real life experience as well. So as you referred, there are artworks which are not replaceable and we don't want to replace them, but we, need, we want to build this library of artworks, which is open for everyone and can become a material for museum shows and can be shown and not buried in a warehouse. And Johan said, yes, this is fantastic. And this church is like, we can do it there. And it's interesting that you said about the church because uh, I was speaking about it in previous symposiums as well. I think art uh, becomes the new religion in an essence that um, people do go to museums these weekends. Now, it's before it was a church, and uh, we need, we search for these borderline experiences. Uh, we search for something which is not in our life. Like, I was shocked when I saw YouTube and Marina Abramovich performance in MoMA when her ex-husband is coming to her and it has 70 million views. These are not our professionals. These are people who actually go to see like this gentle moment of something which is undescribable, and only art can give you this today. And also, as in church in previous centuries, everybody would have a chance to have same experience. Doesn't matter what's your background. You come and you can feel the same as a wealthy person, or as a poor person, you're all equal. And museum practically also provides that today. And I don't know about any other, um, I don't know, example which I can throw now. But I guess, yes, art becomes this important thing. And obviously, if we speak about the church a little bit more, there was the first place for multimedia exposure. So you can see the paintings, you can listen to music, you can sing. So uh, I guess museum is this temple today where you can do all of that and have a collective shared experience and feel enlightened, if you're lucky. All these remarks bring us right away to Ed von Yeles. Particularly also when Norma mentioned about art and society, because of course, Ed, uh, your practice is not only the practice of an artist, but also as an urbanist, you put Soho back on the map. So <laughs> it would be great to hear from you about these themes of this morning. Was, it was interesting to think about generosity and this idea of ecosystems and to think about art uh, as an open ecosystem. And, and I think that for the last, I suppose, two years, I've come back to London and been running a lot of events. I work in like performative practice and been developing technologies uh, which perhaps other artists can use as tools for stuff like fundraising. Um, but I think one important thing to, um, to realize is that we exist in a platform that is mutating and changing all the time. And I think Mandich is a, an example of this. Um, and it doesn't have to be the way it is. Like, that's a very important point. For instance, I work a lot in LARP, which is a, a role play discipline, essentially where you become another character and you terraform and you simulate alternative realities. And there's a saying in LARP which is, reality is bad LARP design. And I think reality is bad LARP design. Reality is designed badly and it can function differently. And I think that as an artist is something that I'm very interested in, that um, Keller Easterling has this great idea of an object form which is a static, inert thing and an active form which can go off and proliferate in the world that people can replicate and use as a bit of protocol for reality. So that might be a pattern of behavior, it might be a, a new bit of technology that sort of shapes and directs you in different ways. Um, and I think that it's very important, or at least for me, when producing work, to think in those terms. Like how, how does the work bleed into reality or reality bleed back into the work? Um, yeah, I don't know. How, how does this uh, relate then to uh, this new work, which is described here in the booklet. It's a new installation called Fini Laya, and uh, it basically connects uh, to um, something which is often indecipherable, which is the stock market. So it's also making yeah. something kind of invisible, visible, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think it's um, humans, uh, the best, inter the, the interface they've evolved to read is the, the body and, and facial expressions. And so the Fenilia is an attempt to try to give a body to infrastructure or to things that normally don't have um, an existence in your reality. You know, like if... They do, but they're... Yeah, they are, exactly. Yeah, and, and it's important, because if Fenilia is unhappy for 
for example, uh, there could be uh, people would lose jobs and, I don't know, like the, the, fa the industrial crash is happening and then, you know, it's, it affects society a lot. So, and nobody knows how this catastrophe today is like a line on the TV, actually, and then you don't really feel it, but when it's visually represented, then you can feel the whole power, and art can give this power of emotion back. So, yeah, so you can suddenly have an emotional connection with GDP, which is horrific on one level. And, um, and yeah, so the, these, these being that this one is attached to the, the stocks of uh, Facebook um, and is very happy at the moment. I, um, I must say, uh, it's interesting how quick I bonded with this figure because just seconds ago it was <laughs> banging his head on the floor and I was like, okay, what can we do to, to help him or her? Yeah, so, <laughs> so that, that's uh, interesting. So that, that when it turns green, that's the... Um, the today's value at the moment or how it is at that very instant. So um, that's changing up and down quite a lot. But it, what, so this could also be attached to carbon emissions. It could be attached to uh, the rainforest. And it is a communal, uh, a societal responsibility to change the finilia, essentially. Like the only way to change, for instance, this one would to be all buying Facebook shares, which sounds pretty horrific. But, um, <laughs> But equally so, like, you know, depending on what it represents, it could be a worthy cause. So, but because it connects to our emotional uh, parts in, in the brain, or why? Because it's like the same f with a, a refugee crisis. As soon as there's a picture of a dead child on the beach, there's more... Uh, yeah, so we, we need, bo we need um, uh, portals to be able to relate to large things that are beyond human... Um, compassion or understa emotional understanding and so we worked with um, I worked with a set of designers in Montreal that were looking at what generates empathy so we looked at the proportions of baby for instance um, and so which keys into Kawaii Japanese uh, animated forms um, but yeah it, it looking at what elicits an emotional understanding and I think yeah you, you talk about the bodies washed up on the beach or, or Anne Frank with the Holocaust you know you need um, are often a body to be able to relate to these larger themes. Now I wanted to wrap this panel up because we're soon basically gonna listen, but that's, I, don't worry, I have a question, yes. <laughs> because we wanted to end it with you because I think it's particularly interesting that, um, it's particularly interesting that we can listen to Conrad, you know, because it's a view from a very different field. Uh, so I thought we should do that at the end to open it up and then have a coffee break, uh, because as I said, you know, coffee breaks are essential with conferences. And then we read a panel Emerging Trends, which is uh, moderated by, by Daniel Biamba. I wanted to ask you how the theme of this morning, of course, the idea of responsibility, the idea also of generosity, how we can actually address the, the theme of inequality, you know, in, in society right now by finding, you know, uh, models of uh, doing things which, as Tim Berners-Lee said, are for everyone how we can somehow learn from law, how this connects actually to, to your practice as a lawyer. Because I think it's interesting, you know, my friend Alexander Kluge, who is now in his 80s, um, the great filmmaker, writer, novelist, polymath in Germany, is actually for originally a lawyer. And he said it helped him a lot to be a lawyer to create, in a way, art which is for everyone. Because he managed at the moment when private TV started in Germany, to lose, to use a loophole in the law. Because he realized, sorry? 68. Yeah, very 68. It connects very much to that conversation. And he realized that there was a loophole in the law, which is that actually every private channel, which starts, you know, Dreisat and so on, they need to have a cultural percentage. And he just occupied it. And even if, you know, this content is highly experimental and uh, radically experimental, the channels could never get rid of him again. Uh, so it's a very interesting, you know, strategy, very Felix Gonzalez Torres kind of idea of infiltration. So I just was very curious what we can learn from law, what you as a lawyer take away from what everybody said on the panel today and how it connects to, to what you do. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to touch on a point uh, that Johan mentioned about um, the experiences. And I believe that in today's society, experiences become much more important than they used to be. People choose experiences over um, value um, or assets, over the possession or ownership of assets. Um, and I believe this is a, a big opportunity for art and artists to, um, to, um, to, to cater for this uh, thriving of experiences. And um, 
to, to come back to your question, I believe um, looking at the art market from an external view, um, we see that the art market is a rather traditional market that hasn't uh, opened up to technology um, so much yet um, compared to other markets. And um, the use of technology will enable us uh, and will enable the art market uh, to be more democratized um, to create a framework in which new artists th can thrive and in which new ideas can be explored, such as we see with, uh, with Ed, for example. And um, um, from um, looking at other markets uh, historically, um, we can, for example, see that when the stock markets came into play, uh, at first it was a, a very uh, wild, wild west scenario, and, um, and now it's a very, um, it's a very investor-friendly um, um, setup, um, whereas the art market is still in a very early stage where technology is implemented and it will create um, disruption and it will create new opportunities uh, on both sides. And um, this framework, uh, I believe, will allow um, a, new, um, a new era and, and many more artists um, than, um, than before to actually, uh, it will give them the chance to present their art, to show their art, to uh, be independent in um, showing their art and not depend on, on, on a few players maybe in the market. Um, so I believe this will have an, uh, a, 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 a very, uh, inno the, the innovation will have a great effect on the art market. And are you collaborating with artists? Are there any kind of dialogues or collaborations? Yeah, from a professional... Uh, no, because of course, you know, thinking about all of these new, um, all of these new dimensions now, I mean, it's something which happens certainly also with, you know, AR projects, with VR projects. It will lead to whole other forms of contracts, to whole other forms of, you know, so artists and lawyers might collaborate on that in a different way. That's what... It's, it's a perfect summary because it also opens up what I, I will return directly to you when I moderate the next. Uh, uh, so I think Very good. We should really stop yeah. here because it yeah. leads directly to... I have a question for Lucia. <laughs> so I think we're all talking now in a rational way and I thought Lucia's idea of wood web was extremely interesting because it, get, no, it gets to another dimension and generosity in nature is not counted. And now we're always talking about how the, virtu like, the virtuality is actually all based on numbers. Instead, nature is not based on number. Nature is the pure freedom of generosity. Wow. I mean, I agree. Yeah, but, like, how but, but I also don't necessarily... Just a, thank you. Tw 10 seconds. Uh, about the fact that I wonder whether like we're talking about technology and digital technology, it's a question for Ben for later, because I feel like technology, digital, we've kind of interchanged the words, and I wonder whether, like art is a form of technology, what plants do is incredibly technologically complex. So I wonder, maybe we need to think a little bit about that together. I just would like to add, there is no contradiction. I think everything is beneficial mm -hmm. one to another, and we shouldn't juxtapose technology yeah. and nature, as we shouldn't juxtapose art and uh, finance also, because finance helps art to thrive and to make exhibitions like Medici has done. So I guess we should stop feeling shame to comment on uh, uh, on, on the parts of uh, which we are not experts, but we just embrace that everything is interdependent and this is the ecosystem which helps everyone and we should look at the ecology and the nature and look into technology and see how these tools or these languages could be incorporated to create something new and uh, better. And we should foremost... You know, I was asked to uh, uh, talk, speak on a panel about reducing the carbon footprint of the art world in Basel, which was a very interesting exper experiment to talk about reducing the carbon footprint of the art world in Basel. And we spoke, and there was someone brilliant, two other brilliant panelists who talked about different uh, aspects of it. And then someone asked me, what do you think is the point of this panel here? 
And I just thought, well, you know, if there's someone in the audience who, was conv who has sort of, you know, access to politicians or access to some kind of, you know, who has money or power, and you were convinced by this argument, then you can go off and do something else. So, uh, you know, there's, sometimes there's like some sort of unexpected strategic yeah. effects. But you see, for me, yeah, we have more questions. Here. Hello. Yeah, I think it's all evolution. We don't need to say that we cancel at Basel tomorrow, but it's going to happen naturally if galleries like Johan would have amazing uh, business, great shows in Berlin, sell well online, then there's no need to travel and uh, people can come and see things in the, yeah, why not? But, it's, but you see, I also think, I think it's not only about... We have a question here. When, yeah, he can sell online now and make sh curated shows inside the church. The reality which you want to translate from, I don't know, from Berlin to Shanghai is on your walls. And, and then, you know, no, I think that's a bit of misunderstanding. I only said that that um, I only uh, I, I did not say like we shouldn't go to art fairs uh, or or we shouldn't ship this stuff around. I just think that. Um, these technologies will offer us alternatives which will have an impact uh, on, on efficiency and also uh, will have a... Uh, uh, because they, they turn the question around what do we really need to ship to around the world? You know, so, so where is this leading? And, um, uh, and I'm just excited about the, the, the future and what it will bring us. I'm just... Let's be real for a second. In 30 years' time, no one's getting on planes. There is no shipping. And if you think about 3D printing, what me and Hans discussed a lot, think about it that sculpture artists actually can print the sculpture by sending the file. So in the museum spaces, we can just print everything and print the whole show, and we don't need to ship it anymore. But I mean, it's not tomorrow, but maybe 10 years. So we have a very active audience here. We have, no, we, have more, we have three more comments, which we would like to think. I just want to say one thing, which I think is, is important in, in answer to these different points which is, of course, we can think about, you know, transformation of the art world. But I think in relation, again, to the earlier question about art into society, I think it's incredibly relevant that we, in relation to the theme of technology, you know, go back again to McLuhan's thing, you know, when he says that artists have this prescient thing, that they, ha they are an early alarm system. So we just should listen to artists and we should, to, should wonder how we can actually not only see artists' works in galleries, in fairs, in museums, et cetera, et cetera, but how we can actually get their ideas into society. And that brings us to another visionary initiative, which is the John Latham Barbara Stavini initiative of the Artist Placement Group, you know, where they basically say that every company, every corporation, every government, all structures should always have an artist in residence and even more so an artist on the board. So whoever of you has a company or a governmental structure or an institution, you know, put an artist on the board. Artists are there, they're an early alarm system. It's very urgent to listen to artists. We have three more questions. My name is Ronnie. Thank you, everyone. I think that it was very generous of you to give from your time and knowledge. So that was the first thing I wanted to say. I wanted to point out that I was thinking while all of you were talking about, you were saying a lot of beautiful ideas, but I, I don't feel that I've heard enough about giving up comfort and about taking responsibility in the art world. And I think that what is happening now with the Whitney Biennale and the Warner Kenders and uh, uh, works like Hito Steiler from around the world are really pointing fingers to the art world and asking in order to convey our messages our, as artists, who are we allowing to build our platforms and who are we taking these funds from? And I'm very curious to hear from all of you or whoever wants to say, do you think there should be a moral code on whether who you take funds from? Or do you think that artists are even able to refuse? I just graduated my BA in art. And it's a question that I don't, I wouldn't know how to answer if I would be offered an opportunity to exhibit. Would I refuse because I don't, agree with the people who are giving the funds. So I'm very curious to hear what you say. 
think a moral codes always should be without them. It's a catastrophe. So, so my reply on that. I think it's very important, you know, to it, it ties in directly with what I said before. You know, it's very very important uh, for for basically all structures in the art world to to listen to artists in relation to that. I think that's that's the most important thing. Who are the artists? <laughs> <laughs> Genuine we have two great artists on our panel. But it's good if you know, if you, if, if you think about transparency, actually, yes, you are right. Today, not always you can understand where the money is coming from, because there's a lack of transparency. And all of our effort uh, of discussing new technologies are actually helping in this direction, like blockchain, what Ben is going to talk, when you can really track where the thing, how things move and where the money is coming from. So it's not shady anymore. So I guess we all helping in this direction, so you know who is your buyer, and it's becoming very transparent. And um, I think with the development of technology, there will be new sources of, um, of funds that you can tap if you need, uh, as an artist, and you, you have a broader choice. You can make your own choice, you can decide uh, which money, which funds you want to take, if you agree with their values. We have seen, we see that in other markets. Um, for example, in uh, Islamic finance, um, they, um, in Islamic finance, you only invest in assets that you believe um, are in line with your, um, with your ethics and your, um, your views um, of the world. And um, I believe that technology will democratize this, this process, will open up new channels to, to, to get funds and will allow young artists like you to, um, to, choose, to choose carefully where they take money from and um, act in, in line with their beliefs. I think can I just add to that? I think in terms of, I mean, more broadly, when I think we talk about technology, we're just talking about the detail of how the thing is made. Um, the quote that's kind of come to mind in this discussion for me is Gregory Bateson from Ecology of Mind, and he said, a hand, an ax, a tree, an information system. And, you know, there's a long history of thought that pays attention to the way in which systems function and how they reshape the world. And to speak directly to your question, I think that... Uh, the issues that Hito and other artists are addressing in this moment is symptomatic in a response to the fragmentation of power within a global order. And that for any artist thinking about what systems they want to participate in this moment, they have to have some kind of model of how they want to see the world exist because those power structures are shifting dramatically right now. And the actions that you take and the investment that you take will define the way in which the world unfolds over the next 20 or 30 years in a way that I think wasn't true for the last 20, 30 years. I think that's a great uh, conclusion. And uh, we should now have this coffee break. Your excellent question, I think, could be you know, the topic of a whole conference. I think it's a really excellent question. I just wanted to say in relation to what you said, whilst I agree, I also do believe that, you know, listening to artists, we need to always take into account, again, what Pike said, what, what McLuhan said, you know, artists are also injecting doubts into technology. So I don't think that we can just think I'll that, tech that yeah, artists are injecting doubts into technology. You know, if you think about, I mean, we hear about more that later, certainly, um, on Ben's and Daniel's panel, but I mean, you know, artists inject doubts on the promises of AI, and, and they remind us that we should, you know, not only associate the term artificial intelligence solely with positive notions. I think it's important to just put that in the mix. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Svetlana. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you all for being here. With Daniel Birnbaum and uh, I think we are merging it, right? Daniel and uh, Ben Vickers. No, I remember your name perfectly, forever. Um, and Daniel is uh, director of uh, the biggest, uh, I guess, uh, virtual reality production in art world and a former director of Stockholm Moderna Museet, where I met him at Marina Bramwich Retrospective. And I think it was, this, um, yeah, this is how, when you started actually to think about virtual reality seriously. And it's been a long way. So we are very interested to know more about it. And also, I would like to pay your attention on this screen where you can see at the background what Daniel is actually doing and the artists who he creates projects with. And some of them are being shown here. And uh, we start with you, yeah. Thank you, Svetlana. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, so I come from the old, I still have a, one foot in that old 
analog museum that Norman likes to hear about. Uh, no, that we all, I think we're all still partly in that uh, uh, world, but it's true that things are happening, and I think uh, regardless if we are overestimating the importance of these new technologies and how they will disrupt or change or revolutionize our institutions or not, I think it's uh, fair to say that there are very overwhelming new visual possibilities, and uh, I would say VR and uh, AR and all the whole family of, uh, of related technologies, mixed reality, I guess they will all merge into one complex thing in the future. And I do think that they represent the first new medium of the 21st century. They're maybe not one thing, but they will, um, they will, they will evolve and become less clumsy. Uh, I was just at the, at the conference in, in, in Germany, actually, about uh, virtual reality in architecture and, 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 and art. And, and, and Sanford Quinter, who's an interesting theorist from, from the US, who used to pu publish or edit these books, his own books, if you're old enough to remember these, from the 90s, beautiful books about the art and theory. And, and he said that virtual reality is a strange new thing because it promises sublime experiences almost like uh, you talk about shelling or novalis and synthet syn synthesizing object and, and subject and the world and subjectivity but it's all packaged in a highly vulgar horrible ugly technology that we have to wear some sort of plastic mask on the head it's true uh, it, it is a little bit like uh, you know something that edgar Allan poe or someone could write about like machineries that promise fantastic things and and some of us have already experimented with this, and, and uh, you know, I come from a museum which actually has a long story with art and technology. Uh, EAT, this thing in the 1960s, which was a very rich uh, project that went on for many years and involved uh, John Cage and Rauschenberg and many others. Um, it's what people who talk about art and technology always end up talking about. It's like that wonderful thing, but it's also a little bit nostalgic to go on about things that happened exactly half a century ago or even more. So I started to think that what could this be today? And I was introduced to people, you know, Stockholm, a small city up in the north, but it's an important center for technology with Skype and Spotify and, you know, small companies like that who actually have changed a lot. And, and, and so I was introduced into that world and then suddenly they, some people asked, can you not curate this for a while? And I thought, why not? It's an experiment, it's a smaller thing, it's not running a big institution. So we've done things with the very well-known artists and this is backstage material with the Anish Kapoor and uh, Marina Abramovic and Olafur and others. Um, but we also do all kinds of lighter, quicker, smaller projects. We just did a beautiful thing, I actually have to say, or the artist did a beautiful thing. Koo Jong Ah, this Korean artist who lives here in London, did an augmented reality piece, which was site-specific in an edition of one, sitting in the garden of the Bailey outside Basel. And people went up and looked at it. It really looked beautiful. I, I thought this was a humble project compared to many others but I think one of the richer and more beautiful from a true artistic point of view. And I think that this will open up possibilities that are not only to do with some sort of overwhelming wow factor. VR has the problem that it's sometimes so damn overwhelming. Anish actually gave an interview in, in the Financial Times recently where he talked about his piece and he said it's a dangerous medium because you're you're lured into thinking that you're doing something great, but maybe what you're producing is kitsch. It is dangerous because it's so overwhelming, and I think he did a beautiful piece, actually. We're all involved with different aspects of this contemporary world, which is not so far away since we all have VR in our pockets, basically, or AR, and I mean, there are the small computers that we all ca carry around. It's not like that technology is far away. It's actually, we're with it all the time, and most of us check our emails all the time, or what, not only emails, everything. It's it infiltrates everything anyhow. So uh, the analog museum, for instance, is totally, you know, bombarded by this all, all the time. Hans Ullich, um, who had to leave, um, talked about art being an early alarm system. It's a quote from Marshall McLuhan, that somehow artists would anticipate things to come. It's a little bit of an old romantic idea, maybe, that artists would be, uh, yeah, but it is an interesting thing. And the question is, what does it mean? I mean, if Hilma of Clint predicts the World War II, that's a very old school idea, but she did make maps of Nazi Germany, uh, 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 you know, emerging a few years before Nazi Germany happened. But that's maybe not so common, but there are many, many examples of, of artists somehow creating works that... Actually, I have to 
disagree with you. I mean, Gustav <laughs> invented yeah. the word, uh, Gustav Metzger that Hans was talking about, he did invent the, you know, the concepts of climate change. I mean, he said he talked about them back in the 1950s. Yes, yeah. And he foresaw what was going on. And when he did auto-destruction in art back in the 1950s, it was an amazing metaphor because artists basically make metaphors of the future in their different ways. When Picasso painted the Demoiselle d'Avignon, he is painting a metaphor of a future. And I mean, you know, I think artists, that is one thing that artists or creative people do. Yeah. Creative people, I always prefer the expression creative people rather than the word artist, which sort of, as I said to say to somebody earlier, you have men, then you have women, and then you have artists. I'd like to take that artist concept out of the equation and talk about creative people. That's creative good. Creative people doing creative things, that is better. And creative people, thinkers, writers, mathematicians, physicists, it doesn't matter, artists, is it? whether they paint or whether they make anal uh, beg your pardon, digital, digital things, are basically looking into and peering into the future. And, you know, peering in by being in the present, because you, in fact, you never quite know what the future is. But there are certain people who have the ability, you know, whether it's, uh, I don't know, what's he called, the black hole super guard, what's he called, the, the, uh, what? Yeah, Norman, thank you for opening, thank you for opening a door which is already wide open and exactly what we're going to talk about. The, if, of course, it's just I wanted to be a little bit more sophisticated than what you were saying, because there are many ways of opening the future. I mean, there's the idea that we look into the future and know exactly what's going to happen, and that would be the Hilma of Clint example. But there are many, you know, versions of people trying to create things or actually creating things that are maybe not quite possible. Uh, recently, I heard Slavoj Žižek talking about um, um, Emily Bronte, how, sh how her Withering Heights is actually written as a film script, although, you know, with a beginning and end and, and flashbacks and all of that. There was no film yet, but she was already creating things that had, you know, cinematic qualities. Borges wrote hypertext before there was a computer. These are different versions of it, you know, that they were, uh, you know, trying to do things that the next medium will make possible. It's um, you know something that Walter Benjamin spells out in the famous essay on, on reproduction, where he talks about yeah. Berlioz when he wrote the damnation of Paris. Good example. Piece yes. Of music, yeah. Which is written as though it was a film script. Yeah, exactly. Not, you know, yeah. Not like an opera. Like yeah. A yeah. Opera. Yeah. Yeah, there are infinite numbers of, of uh, examples of this. But I wonder now, I mean, what will um, what will happen to the art? Well, I think what will happen to the institutions, what will happen to the idea of art as something that we can collect, or since this is also relating to, to a platform and, it, and to the art market, in, directly or indirectly. I thought that where we ended the last conversation about you know, collecting or buying or um, owning things, and, and you said that it seems that people today are not, I mean younger people, millennials or whatever, are less interested in, in owning unique things and more interested in experiences. I think, I don't know if this is true, but it's something one always reads about, that this will be the case. Um, and what would that mean? I mean, uh, I have uh, the same question kind of for you and for Johan, because that ice cube, you didn't sell it, but you thought about, you know, maybe not the ice cube, but an AR piece, which has no materiality. It is a decision that you can, you know, you know, you make the decision together with the artist. It's an edition of one or 10 or, I mean, in a way it's not so different from a photograph, but there's nothing there. There's just something that appears on the telephone. But what will this mean for these experiences, if they're commercialized or in any way, uh, uh, um, you know, part of some sort of exchange that involves financial uh, aspects? What, I mean, what are the challenges? What are, the, what are your thoughts about this? Since I know you're a legal expert, but actually very close to the art world in, in all its aspects. Um, yes, uh, thank you. I, I think um, that's what you said is very true. The, um, uh, the younger generations and people, people, our society today is more interested in experiencing um, and in experiences than in, in, in ownership. And um, historically, ownership was, uh, was really the only way to exercise power over a thing. Um, that is a very, um, there was a very stiff concept that you needed to, to own a thing to enjoy it. 
um, that dates back until uh, Roman laws and uh, was one of the the Jus Abutendi, which which is in our um, uh, um, in, in our um, program. Um, so this concept um, is now uh, revolutionized by. Um, by, by technology, because technology allows us to disconnect ownership um, and possession. Uh, from, from possession, and um, this, this, uh, this disconnection allows us to, um, to um, enjoy ownership um, in different ways. So um, we're already experiencing um, a lot of share, uh, shared uh, um, uh, sharing community things, like, like car sharing, um, and I believe that in the uh, in in the in the legal world uh, in the in the, in the art world, um, the the use of technology will um, will open up um, this field even further, and um, by um, creating new possibilities um, of, um, of of revenue streams for for artists, of funding models, of um, um, of, of sharing models um, will um, increase the possibilities for people and for artists to, to share their art and make it more accessible um, to, um, to people. Sorry, I just want to say that uh, we should uh, separate possession and ownership because you can, in the model which I'm talking about, you can own a piece, you even can sell it, but you can't destroy it or abuse it because you don't really hold it in your arms. The piece is still in the gallery on public viewing and everybody can experience that. And they can, uh, so museum is possessing. But you can own, you can sell, you can invest in it and you can do whatever you want. But now through technology, we can separate these two things. And this is how we make it more democratizing. And this is how we change the paradigm of possession generally, this use of Butendi you're referring to. Exactly, so Malevich is, is actually the best, the best um, um, example for, for this uh, separation of ownership and enjoyment of, a th um, of, of art because uh, the platform allows you to own a piece uh, while it is actually accessible to a wider public and traveling around uh, galleries, museums, uh, different sort of shows. Um, so Johan, oh. did you give this uh, any thought when you, I mean, you now represent an artist who's doing a AR, augmented reality pieces, and it was all very new, and it's only been visible in Basel, basically, and there was a, a, a one located at the very prominent museum's garden, but you could also, uh, you, you didn't go ahead because things were not so clear, but if you would sell these things, how, uh, what are the challenges there? No, the, the, uh, the, the beginning problem is more that, um, the, that we have a uh, um, like conflict of interest in the first place, because the Technology offers uh, and implements already free access, but that goes against um, exclusive, 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 exclusivity and um, uh, and cutting like like making something rare. So the art market um, is based on uh, on minimizing the output, and because something is very rare and unique. Um, uh, it's hard to get, and the the the, uh, the demand is uh, rising, and the, the the prices go up. So um, this idea of multiplying photography, for example, or videos, is a fully invented one. So there's no there's why we ended up at edition of five or six or ten or whatever. It's completely um, uh, it's it's just. Um, a standard which is set and became a usual market uh, industry standard. Um, and it's very important uh, to stick to it because that's your reputation and you capitalize on that. So artists like Nan Golden, for example, she didn't take that too serious. Uh, so her market is very weak because you can't really know uh, if the um, assigned one of five is really accurate. And, and that destroys... Uh, which markets are always based on uh, is confidence and belief. And, um, and to circle back to Ko Jong As project at the Baylor Foundation, I think Ko's idea is more to have access to everybody. And that again runs against the interest of selling it exclusively. And then the reason is also the sales pitch to say, okay, that's limited on five, but everybody can have access to it is is then uh, you're losing the argument of why somebody should sell it. 
Uh, but there's an interesting phenomenon uh, which we took practice or, or were involved in, in the US. For example, is Camille Rose's uh, famous piece, Grosse Fatigue, uh, owned by three museums. And, and that's uh, something which is um, starting more and more that institutions co-acquire video installations and then they uh, show it uh, in this um, institution for a period of time and then in the other one for a period of time, but they co-own it, which is interesting that this started based on video work, because why not co-owning a painting? So, uh, of course, it's much easier to, to just transfer the data uh, for projection. Um, and this is something uh, I think Malevich offers or, uh, um, or we, we, we're going to profit from in the future, that we co um, collectively, all of us, own work. I mean, we do that in Germany, for example, anyway, because a public museum is belonging to all of us German citizens. Or, uh, uh, um, and, but I think the great future is also to, also maybe to your question, where the money comes from, and, and how, how do you know where the money comes from and how, 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 how legit it is. If we have a public domain where we all can, like Kickstarter style, share ownership, um, also is a possibility to, to uh, realize projects, I think. Sorry, Can I just... Um, sorry oh. to be a moment, but are yeah. these surprise I and aspire to where literature has always been, and certainly for several hundred years since the invention of printing, and where music has been ever since the invention of recording music, <laughs> whereas where it is relatively, you, you know, for a small sum of money, you can read a book, or for a small sum of money, you can listen to a piece of music. Or uh, something that I've been wanting to, uh, to bring up is performance. Because perform these questions around how performance exists, which you've kind of touched on very, before very um, momentarily, is something that leads a lot of this discussion has been going on for a long time of how one acquires performance, how, how it exists. And um, I have a gallery um, called Vitrine, and we did a show in the spring which was called If It's Not Meant to Last, It's Performance, and it was looking at ephemeral works. And I did actually sell an ice cube, basically. Uh, through, um, uh, it was through instructions. And in the same way that solar wit paintings uh, are, are acquired through instruction, um, the, 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 the legacy of performance and thinking about how performance sits within the art market is, um, is very much bringing up these questions. Can, of, of can a performance become very expensive? I mean, absolutely. I mean, value. The, <laughs> yeah. I mean, value. And I think this is where this is where it's also the idea question, but how expensive? Of, of also uh, syn like syndicates and the idea of like who, how, what you're doing absolutely could would work would be instrumental for performance because the idea of actually a group of individuals acquiring performance and so then so how much is it in sitting within a, 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 a and we like also and I, I just want to say because I worked with a um, with a lawyer so she's an associate director and worked with me on these works and and how the instructions and the contracts exist where essentially you don't have shipping because you don't have you, you know you don't, you have you have the idea, you have the instructions, you have the materials to make that thing happen, perhaps. Um, and, and yeah, and it could sit in a museum and be held by a museum, but be acquired by a number of people. So I just wanted to yeah, bring it back to performance, because performance has been questioning Johanna this for some a, time. Reply. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's so easy. Uh, uh, um, like, for example, a Tino Segal exhibition is more expensive than uh, a baking show, because, oh yeah, because, because it's, uh, and also uh, a performance, um, it's not, uh, you can't just write it down and then it's, you send it over and it works, so you have to, um, yeah, you, you can actually better explain. No, 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 I wanted to listen to you, I just... It, it no, I think you have to monitor it and you have to, you have to, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, train people and, um, um, and be involved in the whole process of, of, of setting it up. So per, to, to think that performance art is less, uh, cost involved is an illusion, oh, no, I think. Absolutely, yeah, t I totally agree. And I think one of the things 
Um, I work with an artist, Tim Etchells, who works between the theatre world and the visual art world. And in the theatre world, he's very well paid for his role as the director of Force Entertainment. In the, in, in the visual art world, he also creates performance, and we are constantly addressing like how those performance exist, rather than just being something alongside then his, his, more, his physical works uh, with using language, but actually the performances themselves, because I think that's a question that comes up as a, as a, as a small gallery. I, I work with performance artists, and I want to, to, to develop that more and more, but I'm also aware there's a big problem because it's very costly. And at the moment, the visual art world, let's, you know, how, where do the budgets come from to allow that the, the, the ecology of performance work for performance artists when they want to, to, to uh, be pay themselves or pay the performers or, or produce all these kind of... It's, it's I think performance can pay for itself. If it's organized, let's say, like an opera production, you need an investment at the beginning, then you create, and then uh, the audience is paying in little bits. And this is the example of uh, co-ownership, as you spoke. So when it comes uh, not to performance, I must say that uh, I wouldn't complicate things. And uh, in our platform, we would sell a piece to one person. So practically, audience has it for free in the museum, and somebody else is paying for it. So it's not that we are offering people to co-own piece by shares, because it's very dangerous if uh, somebody starts to sell some shares for price which is not fair, like let's say very, very expensive, that means the whole price of the whole piece is, becomes like several times more, and this is not uh, correct from market perspective. It can be very easily manipulated as all of these bubbles in the stock market, and we don't want that. So, but performance itself, it could be just, uh, you know, I think unfolds in time. So if you would have an investor, uh, let's say a collector, who would acquire performance, invest in it and fund it, and then you create it, and then uh, the audience is paying it. This is the perfect example of shared artwork. So, um, um, one, uh, one, one very important point that um, Svetlana and Johan touched on is, is trust. Trust in the market, in the art market. And when when we advise clients that, uh, that consider investing in art, one of their biggest fears is um, they don't trust the market because um, the market is to some extent unregulated. Um, it is to some extent intransparent and um, you don't really, the, the drivers for prices are not very, um, very clear. So. Um, all these um, points um, create a certain sense of um, hesitation to actually put money in the market uh, while the money is already lined up and ready to be invested. So um, I think one of the biggest challenges that um, come with new technology for the art market is um, to use the technology wisely to, to actually um, resolve these problems, to to create a certain sense of self-regulation that um, allows more transparency and um, that prevents things from happening like, like insider trading or other anti-competitive behavior so that you can actually trust um, the prices that you see. So um, given, uh, for example, if, if for the love of God, if Damien Hirst buys his work for, for 50 million and then says, this is my market value, this is obviously something that um, that doesn't work um, in, in a, for, for investors. So um, this is this is one of the biggest challenges, and and that touches up, uh, on what you said earlier when you say um, artists don't take one one artist didn't take it too serious. Um, they you didn't know how many works they actually produced, and um, uh, that affected the price. And this is exactly the sort of behavior that. Um, creates the sense of uncertainty when putting money in the market. I think this is actually a huge theme about uh, you know, how the art market uh, is based on trust, uh, also on uh, a certain ra ra the rareness, the scarcity of objects that creates this kind of attraction that people want to own it. I know it so well f from the museum world where you know, if you have to buy something, then, then normally you hear that two other major museums have it, and then it becomes more attractive. And I'm sure for private collectors, it's just the same, that you know, there are only seven or five, and who, el who else has it? And, and I, I guess we have many examples of things anticipating this, so it's not entirely new. I mean, the conceptual art is full of such things. And I've, one of the strange things in my previous job was that we had this big 
Duchamp collection, all editions, you know, all made in the 1960s, but signed by Duchamp, uh, by, uh, produced in dialogue with a strange jazz musician and, and uh, uh, art historian in, in Stockholm, Ulf Linde, and, you know, the, uh, Antoine Monnier, the, the grandchild, basically, the person running the Duchamp uh, uh, Foundation now, is always nervous that there are, you know, the, the Arturo Schwarz editions are, what are they, Norman? Seven, eight of each, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, various generations. Yeah. Take, take the case of Carl Andre. When he made the legendary bricks, yeah. they were deliberately made and thought of as having, as it were, art outside the value system. Yeah. Now, if you want to buy, you know, 20 bricks by Carl Andre, you'll pay 100,000 pounds or 300,000 pounds. I mean, you'll tell me the right. Yeah, yeah. More, maybe a million. I mean, it doesn't care. I mean, but it, what is so interesting is. Can you the yeah, yeah, I will when, when he's done. Okay, yeah, because, um, you know, the Duchamp, it is very important for Antoine and the foundation. How many are there? I mean, there, it has to be very clear. And in Stockholm, there's exactly one, parenthesis, one exclamation mark of each. Not, the, you know, the things that Mr. Linde did on the side and, you know, that has actually, you know, it, it, it would, could destroy everything. And Arturo Schwarz has, I think, seven of each. And that's it. And then uh, suddenly there's uh, one um, bottle rack that belonged to Robert Rauschenberg that was sold to the Art Institute of Chicago last year. Nine million? Or I said, was it nine? And Tadeo said more. So I don't know how much it was. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's a signed object, it has a beautiful, but, you know, just saying that conceptual art uh, uh, has anticipated or, you know, many of these problems, I guess, or many of these challenges and issues. Back to the, the, the theme where, uh, where Norman had so many good examples, where artists actually do anticipate. I walked through the Venice Biennale and I had a conversation with Isaac Julian, um, who is, as you all know, filmmaker, video artist, and he was looking at many works, and I kind of, we made almost a joke of it, things that are anticipating some sort of immersive technological, that, you know, works that, you know, we exaggerated, but that wanted to be virtual reality, that but weren't. You know, that, you know, heat or stales, big, clumsy, sorry, but, you know, I even told her, why didn't you do it in VR? You know, the big kind of spherical monitor, maybe he want, she wanted that, and, and it should be this object that you can see from the back, but it did want to create immersion. Um, we had, the, you know, I can't remember now, Cyprian Gaillard, it is a beautiful hologram, but very primitive. Um, Ed Atkins is almost like almost taking off. There are all these things, and uh, maybe uh, 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 I mean we had more examples, but I can't remember now. We Would you? Beach. Yes, totally. Yeah. yeah, but it's beautiful that you didn't do it in VR. But maybe exactly. the works have a yeah yeah. It's not an, ex ex it's not yeah. an experience of immersive technology or trying to be immersive. Technology. No, so maybe that's an yeah. example which is not a good example then. Yeah. You know, that's something it, that should it, only VR exist. VR is yeah. a tool, it's practically. A but yeah. it would be interesting to hear from the artist's point of view. Will video kill the radio star? Well, I, I mean, personally, for me, the, 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 the problem with VR is that it's, it gives the, uh, the viewer too much autonomy. And that's something I don't want from my viewer, <laughs> <Yeah>. unfortunately. <laughs> like, that's, Sorry. yeah, I mean, it's like, as I was saying earlier, I work with these outmoded forms with 16 mil, with, with VHS, et cetera, only to then rupture into digital later. But, but if someone puts on a headset, they're ready for it, you know, they're, and therefore the, subver the level of subversion goes way down in my, in my mind. Same with 3D, same with anything where you give a viewer this, this moment of kind of preparing for, for this. And I, I could see Hito being the same way. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. There's also an attraction to obsolete. I mean, the obsolescence Absolutely. is maybe a stronger attraction well, than, than f future possibilities. Well, it's the familiarity of these mediums that um, breed a sort of, people aren't expecting to be challenged by something that they believe they know. Whereas VR, they're kind of in there uh, really looking for it, you know, really ready. So that's, that's my, you know, that's why I choose to work without it. I, I mean, I really um, believe in immersion. Like that's, I think if you get somebody into an immersive state, you can basically simulate or terraform like a new perspective on reality or something. And I think that's something that I would like to chase, be it like a sculptural work or a digital work or, or VR. In fact, the, the one VR thing that I have done was a pornographic VR where you're, constantly having sex with various people and your body and the other person's body uh, is changing every 20 seconds outside of your control from race to age to body type. And that's something that can only be achieved in that platform. 
And I think that's also something to consider and, and <laughs> well, I mean, maybe not. Uh, um, but, uh, but that's something to consider is like th that these technologies that we're talking about, each of them are distinct and have a new framework of possibilities and they're unmapped essentially. I mean, what you're doing here is a mapping process. And I think um, that's something to be aware of. And um, two curators on the panel. I mean, I wonder what these technologies mean and imply uh, uh, for curatorial possibilities. I mean, um, I sometimes think of, uh, of Kraftwerk that made concerts in two places at the same, I think, Tokyo and Los Angeles, just to irritate everyone, or confuse everyone. But, you know, you can actually do uh, uh, panels like this very soon, it's still clumsy and ugly, but in principle, it's totally possible to do uh, conferences in several cities. In surgery, you operate on the same heart, and one, uh, one doctor is in London, the other one is in Cologne, and they look at the same thing, and they operate in, in real time on the same heart. Um, so, of course, for art, this also must you know, open other possibilities that's not only from the art production side, but also from the curatorial point of view. I mean, since I know the Serpentine is really very active when it comes to exploring the possibilities of, of these new technologies, not only for the actual art base, but for the whole, for the, for the show. What, I mean, Ben, what do you think? Will there be biennials in, in, in virtual space, or will there be art fairs? We, we're, we already heard, Johan thinks that in the future we will not, not, you know, we won't have to go to Hong Kong, or maybe we simply will not afford. We can't afford going to Hong Kong in 30 years, who knows? And, and it's just immoral and absurd, and no one would sit on a plane and you know, leave for two days and then go back. What, what are the curatorial possibilities of these, of these technologies? Maybe, I, mean, I know you're, I mean, you, that's what I, you're working always, on. Yeah. I mean, but it's always tricky, because I, on one level, yes, that's what I'm working on, and then on another level, that's absolutely not what I'm working on. Um, <laughs> and I think, the, I mean, there's a great, there's a great, Robert Anton Wilson, there's a great Robert Anton Wilson quote about uh, the, the, the place of ambiguity uh, is the place where shamans are fighting to the death over the definition of what reality qualifies as in this moment. And I think, you know, in a kind of post-truth scenario that we're playing with language and uh, it's convenient to use technology because of its ambiguity in order to rewrite things that had been locked in stone for a long time. And it, it opens up, for me, it opens up a portal in which uh, you can begin to change the meaning of things that for hundreds of years have been locked, locked down. Um, so what it presents for the curatorial is, I guess the curatorial, I guess, what's tricky is the, the language and the, I guess the conservatism around the language and that curator means like a very specific thing within the kind of way in which it's conducted within the art world and there are very rigid rules about what you can do and I think actually it's, it's really uh, brilliant to see what you're doing Daniel because in many ways you're taking a very necessary risk to kind of push and say actually we need to be making in a completely different way and certainly at the Serpentine, as you will have at Acute, you realize that the, the process of production com changes completely. And actually, if you want to realize a large-scale artificial intelligence project, um, and an artist wants to do that, they need to understand artificial intelligence, and they also need to understand the, the act of making art. And that takes us into something that's like, like Herman Hess, the glass bead game. And there are not many players. Um, but it also um, creates a scenario where the, the, the people working on artificial intelligence are themselves the artists, but they're not recognized as such within the frame of the art world. And so I think that we're in this funny, very funny situation in which the uh, defense of language inside the art world industrial complex prevents the shifting of meaning. So can I, think, can I, mean, I say something? Yeah, I think uh, um, virtual reality is an amazing tool but we are on the stage when, let's say, the medium of photography would be created and we would show each other any photography, just say, this is a great art, doesn't matter what's inside. Uh, virtual reality can uh, help to create new content, but it's about uh, content, and virtual reality is a medium which can help that. And I think we just don't know how to use it properly, but you are doing a great job in this direction, and very soon, uh, it will evolve in new creations we, which we cannot even imagine. Because for now, we just try to show a photography in virtual reality or walk in person in virtual reality, which is like not as great as a real experience. But maybe there is something else as this sex situation, like which you can't really imagine in the real life. And this is the thing, and I think this is what's interesting about it.
I, I think you're totally right that we're in, uh, you know, when a new strong technic technical possibility, a new medium basically appears, yeah. there's always a, a window of confusion and, and misunderstandings and exaggerations. When photography appeared, we didn't know if it was uh, occult science or science or will it kill painting and there were all these ideas. And we're in that, uh, you know, in that window of uh, uh, confusion, but maybe you know, an interesting window of experimentalism also right now. And, and so it's, it's interesting to think about it, but I think you're 100% right that there are lots of things in that window that we look at and say, oh, it's wonderful art, but maybe it isn't. You know, <laughs> we, we don't know. Yeah. Um, maybe, can I take that as yes. an opportunity because we're, we're performing a merger at this we're moment. We're merging the two panels since uh, we're both very <laughs> close. So I think, you know. And I, so yeah. I think it's my responsibility yes. to usher in the new digital age. Yes. You should. Um, and so just by way of starting, and I'll also I'll hand it to you, Lucia, directly because I don't think we've heard enough from you on this panel necessarily. Um, so, so thinking all about it. The though. new title, uh, the, the title for this segment is the, the New Digital Age, and it, it's wonderful when a title is given to you um, because you have to kind of find meaning in that title. And so um, I think there's something worth saying that I kind of touched on before in that I think when we talk about technology and we talk about infrastructure, we talk about systems, what we're talking about is the detail um, and the detail of how those systems come together. And there is a very complex, very sophisticated, evolving system that underlies the Malevich platform, which is known as blockchain. Um, and I'm not going to talk about what blockchain is, but I did publish a book um, that's uh, a taking apart of the original white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto that looks back on what that paper meant and what it did to the world and how it shifts governance. Um, and I think that it's very important to understand the detail of how systems are made and how they're enacted upon the world. Um, and I bring that in connection to something that you said earlier, Norman, about uh, this, the seven billion trees that we need to plant on the planet. So as somebody that's interested in technology, I spend a lot of time looking for emergent, strange phenomena. And one company that I always use as an example when I'm speaking about the impact of large-scale computational systems is a company called Biocarbon Engineering, which was founded about three years ago. And their strap line is, our response to industrial-scale deforestation is industrial-scale reforestation. And what they mean by that is they want to plant a billion trees at a time using drones. And I think what's important is what is that vision of the world and what does it run up against? Because I think that it's important to also pay attention to the other systems that are emerging and the other systems that are gaining voice. And just because that system uses technology doesn't necessarily mean that it's new and that an oppositional system would be something like permaculture. And in the system of permaculture, you are responsible for watching the land for the first year before you make any decisions about how you change the land. And so in thinking about kind of a new dark, a, a new dark age, a new digital age, um, and thinking about oh. the new age, um, I actually have like a specific question that I'm gonna kind of lead into. Um, and the new age represented this kind of cobbling together of different systems in order to produce a different kind of transcendent experience. And one of the, one of the kind of main aspects of the new age is the use of astrology. And so I think astrology is a very interesting system to pay attention to whether you believe it or not because it allows you to think in time cycles that are much larger than the present. So currently we, live, we think in financial years, we think in democratic year, the process of, of governance, three or four years for a democratic process, but we don't don't think in hundreds of years. And there is a very important astrological cycle called the triplicity cycle, which is a 200 year cycle of air that started almost 200 years ago. And it's, that was the same point in which we discovered oil. And we're just about to enter a new part, a new triplicity cycle, which is 200 years of air. So regardless of whether you think that's important or not, it presents an interesting metaphor for the emergence of all this stuff that's very airy Artificial intelligence. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, here, here I come to my question. So unconventionally for myself, I'm going to quote a Marxist. Um, I'm going to quote Gramsci. And Gramsci says, the old is dying, but the new cannot be born. In this integrum, there arises a great diversity of morbid symptoms. And I'd like to suggest that much of the time, in this moment of great transition, we discuss the symptoms. But I would like to 
go to the question of what is the old that is dying and what is the new that cannot be born? And Lucia, I'll pass that question <laughs> to you. Are you kidding me? As the me? opening of this panel, but I would absolutely love to hear everybody's response to this question. I've been literally following I actually you think astrology. that <laughs> We're not talking about technology. We are talking about the old and the new. And I think that that has unconventional answers. And I think perhaps you would be capable of presenting an unconventional answer. So the first thing I want to say is thank you and ouch. Uh, the other thing is... As you're talking, and this is something that we both know that I know very well in the process of working with you at the Serpentine, which is that we might sort of sound like being on quite different ends of a kind of technology to permaculture spectrum, but when you look at the work that makes us cry, the people we read, the people we're passionate about, uh, it, they end up being the, the planet that we sort of try to keep our bare feet on the ground of it's very much the same, which has to be said. So, and, and, the, and the question of, of the how or the sort of words that come out is just a str strategic sort of decisions that come uh, and manifest themselves in different ways in the same way as, um, you know, being asked, uh, why do you think uh, two golden lines went to performance, I just said, if there were two consecutive ones in painting, I don't think anyone would be asking this question. Uh, so the old and the new, I can answer by way of a slight, which... That's fair. Is a, thank, <laughs> thank you. Which is a little bit uh, like also a realization of a kind of similarness in the things that you've just talked about, Ed, in terms of LARP and reality. Uh, and that is the experience of Venice. I've thought about the work of the Lithuanian Pavilion a lot, and I've thought about it perhaps even more about what it does and what it is after it opened. The business side, I'm going to just quickly get through and then put aside for a second, thank you, uh, which is that the initial investment that we put, or initial sort of spend that we put into the making of the Pavilion, opening it and keeping it open for the opening week, is just a tiny little bit above the cost that it is to rent a national pavilion inside of the Biennale Arsenale complex. So when we say performance is expensive, it is, but it entirely depends on what kind of value we place on human experience, human life, and human presence, and kids and dogs, etc. That's just the sort of financial. We opened something that we didn't know we could keep open. We sort of took a risk based on the notion that there is no failure if you run out of money in the case of a performance. There is no failure because what you're saying, the statement that you say that you do if you stay open is come and see it or whatever, or the work itself and the statement that you do if you don't stay open is well, performance needs a lot of care and money. So that's, so that was just to put it. Sorry, who paid to, for it? Well, for the most part, the initial thing was the Lithuanian government. The Lithuanian government paid for the whole initial. And then there were some private foundations that came in during the opening week and said, we love it, we're going to help you keep it open, not only once a week, but twice a week. So this is sort of, this is what happened. We took a risk and it, we were lucky. So we were lucky. Just 1,000 years ago, or less than 1,000 years ago, I would say 90% of the British Isles was covered with forest. So we cannot lecture the rest of this country and Europe cannot let, and America cannot let lecture the rest of the world unless we kind of reverse this trend because a thousand years in geological time or in planetary time is but a speck. And we need to understand that too. We all need to understand, I mean, you know, the world needs to understand that too. And I think, I mean, another thing that's really interesting to me about your comment to do with metaphor is the relationship between metaphor and material reality and at the same time the relationship between uh, sort of art visualizing something that is going to be a technology or a situation of the world in the future. Say for instance the way in which Sumerian poetry which develops an entire cosmology around uh, sort of deities of earth and sky and gardener deities and so on. Sumerian poetry actually what it do what it is when you read it these marriages between gods and goddesses and what have you are actually sort of information about human pollination of the date palm, which was essentially the kind of primary food source of the entire, and holds up the entirety of Sumerian culture. So the, so the, 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 the connection point between 
what art does in terms of the metaphorical, whether it does it forward or it does it backwards or it does it in terms of endurance, like I'm going to keep this poem alive and through this poem I'm going to remember how you cultivate date, is fundamental to me in a kind of ecological sense. The third and last thing I wanted to say had to do with this mm, question of immersion. I hope this is somehow coming into some way of answering the question. And again, uh, Ed, which is the piece in Venice is opera and it's theater, which means it doesn't have the author authorial voice that, uh, in a similar way that opera and theater is a kind of clustering of individuals. It also has this kind of notion of craft because they come from different, the artists come from different backgrounds and sort of pour into them that craft. It's also a piece of Instagram. I mean, I don't know, I wasn't expecting the fact that it would be so incredibly Instagrammed. And in doing that, it made me realize, it made, uh, it made us realize that it thinks about a perspective shift, which might have to do with the fact that we sometimes like zoom into Google Maps and then eventually, zoop, you're on the road, you know? And so it's sort of a, it's a work that, puts you in a perspective, embodies a perspective that we experience of or begin to think about through technological objects like drones and so on and so forth. So it responds to that. It's also a kind of a chapel, so it responds to a kind of uh, sort of religious, not religious, but spiritual relationship with something. It has this experiential thing. And the last thing that I'm going to say about that has to do with the that it's a chapel in the sense that people walked in pissed off because they were queuing for three hours and walked out in tears. And I thought, what's stuck so much here? You know, what is it that we hold this? That you just sing, you sing, and it sort of comes out. And then finally, it's a beach in the sense that it has, an Im it has a relationship with the neighborhood. It has a real relationship with the neighborhood. The neighbors come and sit on the beach and do what they would do on the beach. So do the singers. The kids, I was asked by a trustee of a major museum if... Um, that, you know, I was told I, was, I had really stage-directed the kids really well. I mean, the three-year-olds are just doing three-year-old things, and so are the dogs. That's it. That's what I wanted to say. There's like immersion life. Thing. Thank you. Just a, a short story uh, about another solar system. Uh, Let's that have I, it. I, that I heard. It, it relates to your question, I think, a little bit. And it was, uh, you know, two planets out there that met, and, and one said, hi, how are you? And the other said, not so well. And, and then the first one asked us, what is it? It's, it? Oh, it's an itch. It's a kind of a strange illness. I don't know what it is. Uh, oh, I think maybe I've had that too. What is it? Yeah, yeah, it's called Homo sapiens. And, and the other one said, you know, don't worry, you'll get over it. I had that too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to respond directly to the question? To that one? Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the old and the new? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's always a case of not being able to tell while it's happening. Mm -hmm. So to me at the moment, CD-ROMs seem old. Is, is, VR gonna, is VR gonna seem old in 10 years? I don't know, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, yeah, it's certainly at this state, it will, right? And that's in, back to the, my, my idea of, of or my, my sort of belief in it being too clunky, et cetera, at the moment. I mean, the reason Hato probably didn't wanna have that as VR is because of a queue of 300 people waiting to put on headsets and standing, you know, wandering in. So yeah, it's a real, I don't know, constant. Uh, but do you really feel as though it's a kind of medium specific, specific question? Because I guess that's something that you kind of dealing in your work and you've referenced a number of times in this conversation today is the, the kind of transcendental experience at the center of actually what you're trying to do and that these mediums are just a mediating force and it's about choosing the right mediating force. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, the way, uh, yeah. And that's 100%. not dying. What's that? That's not no, dying. 100%. No, I mean, that's yeah. what I'm aspiring it's, to do, really, you know. Yeah. It, that, I think we're seeing it with that, with, you know, with the, uh, with the Lithuanian Pavilion. It's, that's what people are looking for still, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's dying. And, and, and in some ways, things like Instagram are making people crave it more, I feel like, you know, in a lot of ways. I want to connect this to legals because I think a particularly interesting area right now um, with respect to blockchain technologies is that they... Seemingly, there's the possibility that we would have the same effect on software and services that's been produced by the open source movement uh, as a result of the ability to copy software and services so that other people can use them. That there's a suggestion within the blockchain space that we're now moving to a moment where we have a kind of open source law, open source legals. And I, I guess very much the Malevich platform is 
predicated on that, and that will be very important to the development and the sort of ecosystems that evolve around artistic works. And I guess it'd be interesting to understand from you whether you, you know, will new things emerge from this, or will it, is it really just a continuation of current legal systems and, and ways of approaching this? Um, no, absolutely. I think there will be new things emerging from that. Um, throughout history, art has uh, always had to redefine itself. Um, art shapes society, and society shapes. Uh, sorry, law. Law shapes. Law had to redefine itself, and law shapes society, and society shapes law. So uh, it is a question of um, um, what the necessities of the um, of the current time are. And so the law will always develop with um, um, technology and uh, progression. And obviously, these these legal questions that are now raised by um, by virtual um, uh, reality or um, by by other forms of technological progress, they are not all answered. They um, this is a question of how we, uh, as a society, want to to treat this, how we ha want to handle this, if we want to. Uh, grant uh, intellectual property rights to open source software, or if we want to um, to um, le uh, let this remain in the public domain, so um, in order to foster further development. So I believe we will see, and we have seen in the past already, and we will see in the future, uh, a lot of new development in in this uh, legal field. And I. Th I think uh, just to I think the, the point that you made is a very like salient one in terms of like an objective to work towards that art may one day be able to attain the same kind of uh, distribution model of books. It's hard to imagine how it would happen. I guess it requires a kind of like matrix like scenario where you don't differentiate between simulation and reality. Some way, but not quite the same level of distribution and with this other economy. And I think in terms of connecting the legals and the, the, the question of like survival strategies, I think Ed and, and Svetlana, it's interesting you know, to have this work specifically, but also more broadly the work and the kind of discourse that you're generating, Ed, in terms of trying to produce new contracts, trying to produce new asset classes. And I guess there's a degree, there's a questionable degree in terms of the legal base for that. Um, but what it means as a kind of material for kind of artistic expression. Um, yeah. So I just want to go back you to your original Oh, thing. excellent. <laughs> well, I think what Take you, it on. Well, I think what you're talking about is, you know, the meme wars. And um, we're all being puppeted by the things that we consume, you know, like... Um, and I think that there are different threads and waves in tension with each other. And I think, I don't know how much you guys, I would like to talk about memes in the broader Richard Dawkins sense of the word as a, a unit of culture that replicates itself. But it doesn't replicate itself outside of you, it replicates itself inside of you. And I think that what we're seeing are these pushes and pulls um, between old and new mimetic waves, essentially, that we're all being caught up in constantly. And I think that our agency within that um, the eye of the storm essentially is, is, is minuscule and it's immersive, um, but we do have some agency within. <laughs> yeah, you, you and I are the immersive, you're the immersive one. Um, yeah, and, and I think that, you know, I've been memeing a lot recently and, and you, what you discover is that the memes puppet you. And I think that that's just something that I would like to make a statement about because I think it kind of interconnects with this idea of a transition between times and modes and that Ben, six years ago or 10 years ago, 
had a different mimetic flow running through you with a different set of parameters and logics that allowed you to make sense of the world. Um, so I don't know what that was, but yeah. In terms of your question about um, contracts, and I suppose maybe that connects in Should some maybe way. Maybe just explain a little bit the artwork. Yeah, so I created this thing called Crypto Certs, and they're basically a fundraising device for artists. So I primarily work with role play and performance, which there's not much cash in. Um, and it's very expensive and very hard to uh, put stuff on. So I created a, a series of um, prints, essentially, that would allow me to interface with a more traditional art system or to the idea of trading art. And the idea is quite simply that, well, not quite simply, is that they are, like artists, a hybrid between an artist's print and a future. Um, so when you buy one, um, a percentage of the profits from my general practice, as well as the profits from the sales of these prints, goes into an Ethereum fund. And that fund grows and grows and grows over time. And as the owner of the certificate, you can cash that money out at any point. But in doing so, you kind of have to damage the art object. So I've kind of gamed it so that's very, I mean, you might cash out. Um, and actually, it's based on uh, this Brad Schmel work where he vacuum packed a Bitcoin into a piece of artwork, which then, I think he sold the work for about $7,000 um, at the height of um, Bitcoin euphoria, it was worth $1 million, at which point the, you know, the collector slashes open the artwork, grabs the coin, and is rich. Uh, <laughs> so It's like Jeff Koons also put the bottle of whiskey in the sculpture, so either you crash the sculpture and get the whiskey, because at the beginning it was more expensive than the work, but now it's vice versa. Yeah, and, and that's maybe an interesting um, question or a dilemma that the, that the collector is perhaps I'm all faced with on some levels. Do you describe the system on your website? Yeah, we've got informative videos. And uh, it's going to Ben Malevich as well. Need, uh, you can invest. <laughs> you can invest. We and on that, yeah, I uh, hand over to Svetlana because I'm conscious that we are running yes, way we are running over time. To, uh, this is true, and we still have to see the film of Ed uh, Fonelis, but uh, I wanted to say that uh, we spoke a lot about all the new with my brother who we created the platform with. And he's actually the brain behind all of the technical side and all of the exchange side. And Vitaly, I wanted to ask you to say, what, what, what do you think about this shift of uh, old and new, just a couple of words? In your idea, what's changing? The plan changed, so I have to answer to you. Thank you, you come here. It's a pleasure for me and for Svetlana, for everybody. So, and uh, I used to work, my name is Vitaly, I used to work in financial, so I was an equity trader, so and not from art. And I see the situation in art at the moment that it's uh, the same as finance uh, was uh, 30 years ago. So it's just for small number of people, so who can, who can trade, who involved, who was involved in finance. So, and nowadays we see the same in art. So that's why the value of art is so small. Uh, we see the culture is the biggest thing in our world, but the value of art world just 60 billion per year. And if you look at finance, uh, it is 80 trillion dollars per year. So not per year, I mean, uh, is the value of uh, capitalization. So, and in art, it will, it should be the same. Maybe with Malevich, maybe same with someone else, but it will be. We need time for it. We try to build the system uh, to open uh, gates for a uh, wide range of people who can uh, go and buy because now it's intransparent, really. And our platform uh, trying to uh, provide the system uh, where uh, each trade is transparent. You can buy, you can sell. You see all trading history. You see all trade records. You see, uh, uh, you can compare each artwork, the same artist. You can compare artists between. So we start do that. Then uh, some analytics, some ecosystem, another will come to this, will analyze it, will open eyes to the wide range of people, and uh, they will inflow in, in, in the uh, art. So, and the value of art should go up dramatically, in my opinion. But at the moment, it's not. But we try to, to, be, to build it. And the idea is to make the commission is uh, too small, because now it's uh, so big and... Uh, as we know, in the financial was the same. So 30 years ago, it was very big gaps, very big commission. And uh, at the moment, uh, you pay just tiny, tiny commission, and you can do whatever you want using your, your phone. So 
the same should be with art as well. Because, uh, and it's how digital helps us uh, to provide this to the art and blockchain as well. So you can track, you can see all track records, so everything. So you can go uh, today to the, our platform, look at this, trying to understand how it works maybe. And we will start uh, trading on Monday. And uh, I uh, believe you will love it. <laughs> so and thank you again, yeah. Thanks a lot. So. Less elite, more egalitarian. That was Vitaly's message, which I got. Yeah. I think yeah. it's time to transition, think, right? Yes, yeah, so transition into a small room, which is just behind these curtains, where we're going to... And don't worry, it's only seven minutes long. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I know everyone's exhausted. Uh, but yeah, it's just through there to the left. And um, yeah, it's a film about the Finelias. Tulip fever about the finita. And uh, thanks so much. So, thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, thank you to Svetlana.